Thank you very much um, for that very uh, generous introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here in Vancouver. Um, you know, when I was growing up in rural southwestern Ontario, we imagined that Vancouver was a city full of long-haired hippies <laughs> who smoke lots of pot and listen to the Grateful Dead. And you can imagine then my sense of apprehension as this evening approached. <laughs> I. Uh, Worried that the music would be too loud, that the lights would be too low, that everyone would be high. <laughs> Imagine my surprise <laughs> when I was confronted with all of you and I realized everything I thought about Vancouver wasn't true. Um, I'm a little disappointed, to be honest. Um, but I'll get over that. Um, so I wanted to tell you a story tonight. I like to tell stories. And I thought I would tell you a story about a woman named... Alva Vanderbilt. And Alva Vanderbilt is one of the great, I think, unsung heroes of the 20th century. Uh, she's a revolutionary. And she plays a key role in the suffragette movement in the early part of this century. Um, and the interesting question that's raised by the story of Alva Vanderbilt is why she was a suffragette, why she was a revolutionary, because there is absolutely nothing in her life, at least at first blush, that would explain or suggest why she ended up um, taking on the establishment. Um, so I want to try and figure out why she did. And I think that's a very important and pertinent question for all of us today, because the question of why people choose to fight, why they choose to rebel, is absolutely central to understanding the world we live in, where there seems to be fighting and rebellion and revolution um, at every turn. So Alva is born in Mobile, Alabama. Her father is a cotton merchant. And they, the family moves to uh, New York City in the 1880s. And uh, uh, her father loses a lot of his fortune. They're kind of shabby gentility. And she grows up to be this um, short, uh, with a very severe face and long, prematurely graying hair. She, a friend of hers, a friend of hers once described her as looking like a cute Pekingese, um, which is actually slightly inaccurate because she's more accurately described, I think, as a cute Pekingese with the heart of a pit bull. She is a piece of work. She, as a child, she is this obstreperous, outrageous, tantrum-throwing, egotistical, impossible child. She yells at people when she doesn't get her way. She gangs up on boys who try and push her down. She is one of this sort of a wild child. And she grows up into this um, extraordinarily driven and ambitious young woman. And she sets her sights on New York society and decides that the only way she's going to be able to accomplish the kinds of things she wants to accomplish is if she marries someone very rich. And so she looks at the available men and her eye settles on a young man named Willie Vanderbilt who was handsome and uh, a great dancer and a wonderful dresser and a great sportsman, and who just happened to be the grandson of Commodore Vanderbilt, who was at the time one of the richest men um, in the world. And so she contrives to meet him. She wins his heart, and they get married. Um, at which point, Alva Vanderbilt throws all of her considerable energy and ambition into being uh, one of the great conspicuous consumers of her era, in fact, of all time. And as someone who's lived in New York over the last 15 years, I can tell you that that's a very long list. Um, the first thing she does is she buys 800 acres in Long Island for their country estate, and she brings in one of the most prominent architects of the day, and he builds something fabulous in shingles overlooking the bay. And then she buys the whole corner lot on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 52nd Street, and she builds essentially a French chateau, which costs in $1890 $3 million, which is about a couple hundred million dollars in today's, uh, today's money. 
And to give you a sense of what it's like, I'm going to read uh, the following description from one of the biographies of the Vanderbilts, which are all exercises in what might, I think, is best termed as real estate porn. Um, <laughs> everything was everywhere. Walls of red African marble, of stamped leather, walls hung with blue silk brocade, with red velvet embroidered with leaves, flowers, and butterflies, enriched with cut crystal and precious stone, Ceilings of mahogany, of bronze, of colored glass, of bamboo, wainscoting of rosewood inlaid with mother of pearl and brass, ebony inlaid with ivory, polished ebony inlaid with satin wood, and Grecian, Oriental, Elizabethan, English, Renaissance, French, and Victorian touches. <laughs> In crowded rooms, bursting with bronze, stained glass, marble mosaics, and friezes. I think you get the idea. Then she decides she wants a yacht. And she builds the, the largest private yacht ever built on that, up to that moment in history, 280 feet long. And it's called, I think you can guess what's coming, the Alpha. It has a staff, as I said, of 52. And then she decides she wants a country cottage. And I won't tell you about the country cottage except to say that she imports 500,000 cubic feet of white Italian marble just for the facade. Um, <laughs> So she has the country house, and she has the city house, and she has the cottage in Newport, Rhode Island, and she has the yacht, and then she turns her attention to her daughter, Consuelo. And Consuelo is this shy girl, um, and she is raised in the most strict manner possible. She's only allowed to speak French to her parents. She is required to wear the most uh, brutal and confining of corsets to improve her figure. Every Saturday, she's required to recite long poems in German to the rest of the family. Um, if she made the slightest misstep in public, Consuelo would ridicule her in front of all the guests. And as Consuelo enters adolescence, Alva starts to uh, entertain very ambitious thoughts for her daughter. And what she decides she wants to do is to marry her daughter into English royalty. Now, um, at the time, this was a very uh, a common thing among um, the wealthy uh, uh, of, of the United States. Um, it was what you did if you were rich in that era is you took your daughter and you married her off um, to the penurious, the broke sons of English royalty. Um, the technical term at the time for that arrangement was cash for class. <laughs> and there were hundreds of these unions at the time. But in typical Alva fashion, she set her sights on the single most eligible uh, young man of English royalty, the 23-year-old Charles Richard John Spencer Churchill, otherwise known as Sonny, who was the ninth uh, Duke of Marlborough, the first cousin of Winston Churchill and the lineal ancestor of Princess Di. And Sonny was the heir to Blenheim Palace, the largest private residence in England, a, uh, a building whose, uh, who, which covered seven acres and made uh, Alva's mansion on the corner of 57th and 5th um, look like a ranch-style uh, ranch bungalow. And Blenheim Palace, as it turns out, is falling apart, and the Duke does not have the money to fix it. And the minute Alva realizes this, she sees her opening. And she concludes that he will make a perfect match for her daughter. <laughs> now, there are two problems with this idea. The first is that uh, Sonny is not Sonny. Uh, he is an incredibly miserable character. And to give you some sense of what he was like, uh, his second wife, Emily Deacon, used to sleep in a separate bedroom with a revolver by her bed <laughs> in case her husband should come to her uh, in the night. The second problem, the second problem is that uh, Consuelo is in love with someone else. She has her heart set on a young man named... Uh, Winthrop Rutherford, or Wintry as he's known. And Wintry is an Adonis. He is this handsome, charming, incredibly skilled athlete, polo playing, um, uh, bon vivant. And he has begun to woo Consuelo, who was all of 18 at the time. And on her 18th birthday, uh, he sends her a single stemmed red rose, and she knows it's from him. And not long after, they go for a bicycle ride up Riverside Drive in Manhattan. And of course, Alva is along acting um, as a chaperone. But just as they're approaching a corner, Wintry looks at Consuelo and they bicycle ahead until they're out of sight of Alva. Uh, 
and Alva pedals as furiously as her short little legs can carry her, and she catches up to them, and she sees a look pass between her daughter and Wintry, and she knows what's happening. And the next day, she abducts her daughter and takes her to Paris for the summer. And Wintry writes one love letter after another, and Alva intercepts and destroys every one. And at the end of the summer, they go to their cottage in Newport, Rhode Island, and she locks Consuelo up in her bedroom and won't let her out for fear that she will run in uh, to Wintry. And finally, Consuelo has enough, and she goes to see her mother, and she climbs the stairs to her mother's palatial bedroom um, with its cherub sconces, um, each of which is uh, holding uh, the letter A, of course. <laughs> and Consuelo turns to her mother and says, I'm engaged to marry Wintry. Uh, I have the right to choose my own husband. And Consuelo, or and Alva, pulls herself up to her full five feet and says, you can't. You have to be a duchess. Do you realize what's at stake? And then she launches into the most astonishingly vitriolic description of exactly what is wrong with, uh, with Winthrop, Winthrop uh, Rutherford until Consuelo realizes that, it's, realizes that it's hopeless, that there's no way to defy this firebrand of a mother that she has. She's crushed. She has no choice. And on November 6th, 1895, New York City witnesses one of the grandest weddings it had ever seen in its history. The leading scion of English royalty meets the, the great-grandson of the richest man in all of America. And you can imagine the scene. I mean, it takes place in St. Thomas's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue, and every single journalist in America is there, and there's a massive crowd, and there's cops holding back the throngs. And, um, and Alva has spared no expense. She has hired no fewer than 80 decorators to fill the church with every flower imaginable. And she puts on a sky blue satin dress with a, with a border of Russian sable, and she marches up the aisle um, with her two young sons on either side of her. And she stands waiting expectantly for her daughter. And she stands and waits and stands and waits, first for five minutes, then for 10 minutes, and then 15 minutes. And Consuelo doesn't show up. And why not? Because she's weeping inconsolably in the arms of her father. She can't imagine what is happening to her. And finally, they clean her up and reapply her makeup, and she marches down the aisle, and she is married to this man, the Duke of Sunny, the Duke of Marlborough. And after the wedding is over, Alva sweeps the two of them into a back room, and they sign a contract that promises the Duke $2.5 million up front in cash and $100,000 uh, a year for life. And then they climb into the carriage, and Sonny turns to his young wife, and he says, I don't love you. I have never loved you. But your responsibility is to bear me an heir and to fix Blenheim Palace. And Consuelo turns around, and she looks back, and she sees her mother, Alva, standing on the sidewalk with tears in her eyes, because it's the greatest moment of her life. This down-at-the-heels girl from Mobile, Alabama, has married off her daughter into, into English royalty. And Alva thinks that nothing that she will ever do or accomplish will ever top that moment. And in that, she's wrong. Right? She, is, she is terribly mistaken, because her life is about to get a good deal more interesting. Now, I said that I thought that what is interesting about Alva is that she's an unlikely radical. And I think you can see why people uh, who have that kind of wealth and that kind of privilege and position rarely turn in to radicals, right? Kim Kardashian is not about to <laughs> join Al Qaeda, right? That's something that's very difficult, um, I think, for us to wrap our minds around. Um, so how do we account for the fact that, as I said at the very beginning, Alva Vanderbilt turns into one of the leading insurgents of the 20th century. Well, I think in order to understand that, we have to understand a little bit about why people choose to rebel. Why do they choose to confront authority and fight back? Now, that's an enormous issue, but the standard explanation that people give, that political scientists and economists give, is that authority creates obedience through the use of deterrence. 
right? If a powerful individual or a society or a community wants people to do something, to obey their will, what they do is they reward them when they obey and they punish them when they disobey. Right? So our criminal justice system is organized around that very principle. And, you know, we have severe penalties for drug dealing because we don't want people to deal drugs. Right? And when people continue to deal drugs, our response to that is always to say, well, that must be because our penalties aren't severe enough. So what you've seen in the United States over the last, for example, over the last 25 years, is as drug dealing has continued to be a social problem, the penalties for it have continued to increase until the point now where you can, if you are convicted of drug dealing in the United States, you can go to jail for longer than if you murder somebody. Right? That's how seriously those penalties have become. And you can see that same principle applied throughout the world. If, if Palestinian insurgents fire rockets at Israeli settlements, Israel hits back. They hit back harder. And if those attacks continue, Israel hit back, hits back even harder. That's the principle of deterrence, that I will escalate the penalties that I impose on you for misbehavior until you realize the costs aren't worth it. Now, of course, the flaw in that thinking is obvious. People still deal drugs in the United States, despite the fact that penalties couldn't be higher. And from time to time, Palestinian groups still fire rockets at Israeli settlements. So there clearly seems to be some limitations to this deterrence model. And in recent years, a group of political scientists have come up and psychologists have come up and said, you know what, that's the wrong model. It doesn't explain why people choose to obey or disobey authority. That the real issue is not the nature of the punishment, but the way in which punishment is enacted. And what this group has argued is that people will obey laws when they perceive them to be legitimate, and they will disobey law, they will defy authority when they perceive authority to be illegitimate. Now, what does, what does legitimacy mean? Well, we perceive authority as legitimate when it meets three criteria. The first is, it is we, some, we think something is legitimate when we are treated with respect, when we feel that we're being heard, when we, when we are given what lawyers call standing. Right? Um, we think something is legitimate when we feel that the administration of law is neutral, when it doesn't favor one party over another, when it doesn't play favorites. And we perceive authority as legitimate when we think of it, of it as trustworthy, when we believe that the law is predictable, that the way the law is today will largely resemble the way the law is tomorrow. There won't be some dramatic arbitrary change overnight. Now think about how different that model is from the deterrent model. The deterrent model assumes that we are wholly rational actors, right? That we our behavior is a function of a rational response to the, to the risks and benefits um, uh, inherent in the system in which we operate. But you, you, know, you weigh rationally what the consequences of your choices are, and you behave accordingly. But legitimacy theory is totally different. It says that the reason you behave is because of a subjective feeling about the way in which you're being treated, right? a feeling about the way you're being treated. That if you feel you're being treated properly, then you'll behave. And if you feel you don't, you won't. Secondly, deterrence is entirely about ends. It's about how you actually, the, the type of punishment that you impose on an individual. But legitimacy theory is entirely about means. Right? It says that the ends are kind of irrelevant. That what people really respond to is the way in which that particular punishment is um, enacted. Now, I could go on and on about the differences I could do an entire one-hour talk about how these two models lead to dramatically different ways of understanding um, human behavior. Um, but I think there is a single and incredibly powerful implication here um, that runs through this notion of legitimacy theory and that helps us understand why people behave the way they do. And that is that when you deny people legitimacy, even people who are on the absolute margins um, of society, they'll rise up. And that when they rise up, there is almost nothing you can do to stop them. That how much you crack down on them will make almost no difference whatsoever. Because nothing serves as a greater engine of defiance 
than the feeling that you are not being treated with respect and not being treated in a trustworthy manner and not being treated with neutrality and fairness. And that's the first principle, I think, to keep in mind when we try to understand what happened uh, to Alva Vanderbilt because she came to believe that she lived in a society that did not grant her legitimacy. Now, that seems hard to believe because she's this incredibly rich woman, right? She's got the yacht with 52 staff on it. She's got the house with 500,000 cubic feet of white Italian marble, right? She's this woman who seems to have every advantage in the world, who's ordering her staff around with impunity and causing her daughters to do this and that and the other. But the truth is that the society that she occupied in the 1890s in New York was incredibly narrow and oppressive. She and all the other wives of the rich were essentially prisoners of their houses. They couldn't go out and have jobs. They couldn't serve any meaningful function in society. They couldn't participate in any way in the political system. They couldn't vote. They couldn't work. Divorce was unheard of. They were supposed to stay at home and keep their mouth shut and dress nicely and put on parties. Right? Meanwhile, their husbands had every freedom in the world. They could go wherever, wherever they wish. They could do whatever they wanted to. Um, the way that, if you look at the divorce laws in those years, a man could divorce a woman if he suspected her of infidelity. A woman could divorce a man only if she had proof of infidelity and proof of physical cruelty. Right? Two totally different standards for a man and a woman. And a man of that era could satisfy every whim. And that's exactly what the men did. They had affairs, they had mistresses, they had private lives that were entirely separate from their home life. And Willie Vanderbilt, Alva Vanderbilt's husband, was no exception. He was a complete playboy. Um, didn't work for a living. He was independently wealthy. He'd inherited this gigantic fortune. He was handsome and charming. And throughout the course of their marriage, he had one affair after another while Alva was forced to stay at home and be the dutiful wife. So on the outside, she was this flamboyant hostess who was building the greatest homes of her era. But in the inside, she was, she was dying inside. And she would later describe the years after her marriage and leading up to the marriage of her daughter as the unhappiest years of her life. Right? She meets a man, a man she loves very much, but she can't leave her husband and divorce him because divorce is unheard of, right? Men can have affairs. Women can't have an affairs. And desperate to save her marriage, she, right before Consuelo's wedding, takes the whole family on a cruise to India. And on the course of that cruise, her husband starts to have an affair in front of her with her best friend. And then when they finally return to Paris at the end of their vacation, he starts to have a completely open affair with a, a high-class French call girl which is written about in all of the tabloids of the era. And she's completely humiliated. And finally, she says, enough. And she kicks him out. And she demands a, a divorce. But of course, divorce is something in that era that never happens. And lawyer after lawyer from the Vanderbilt family fortune come to her and try to talk her out of it. And she says, no, I won't. And they try to stop her. And her lawyer, they beg her to withdraw the petition. And the tabloids descend on her for what will be this extraordinary, the biggest story of the year. And she goes to church in, in Newport, Rhode Island, where she's been going for 20 years. And all of these people that she has known for much of her adult life and who she counted on as her friends turn their backs to her and won't talk to her because she's dared to do something that is considered to be socially um, impermissible. But she, she has no choice. She considers her position to be impossible. And later in life, when she writes her memoirs, there's this incredible, incredibly poignant line where she describes the plight that she suffered in those years and the plight that all the women of her era suffered. She says, it was considered religious, dignified, and correct for the wife to withdraw into the shadows while her husband paid the family respects to the sunshine. And this is the phrase that always gets me. She was supposed to get her sunlight by proxy through the husband. And that heartbreaking phrase, sunlight by proxy, I think puts some of Alva's behavior um, into perspective. Here is this brilliant, ambitious, driven woman 
who today would be an entrepreneur, she would be the captain of industry, she would start a company, she would run for office, she would do all the things that are today available to women, and none of those things are available to her at that time. So what does she do? The only thing she can do, which is to pour all of her energies into building the most extravagant and outrageous houses she can imagine. Right? It also makes uh, sense, I think, of her seemingly excusable, inexcusable behavior over her daughter Consuelo. Right? Consuelo was 18 at the time she met Winthrop uh, Rutherford, and Winthrop was 33. He was this handsome playboy from this rich family who spent all of his time playing polo and golf and wearing... His family was known and this is a direct quote, for wearing expensive clothing. Right? <laughs> he was a playboy, and she looks at him, and she sees yet another version of Willie Vanderbilt, right? this decadent, idle philanderer who would sentence her daughter to a lifetime of misery. And by contrast, what did the Duke of Marlborough offer? Well, at least he was in another country. At least he had a social standing that Wintry did not. At least if she married him, she would be somewhat of importance and influence in the country of England. Now, to our eyes, that sounds like an incredibly cynical calculation that she made because Consuela was in love with Wintry, right? But 100 years ago, when women were treated like property, love seemed to Alva to be an unaffordable luxury. Consuela was her great hope. It was the, she was the love of her life. It was her daughter. And she could not let her daughter squander her life the way that she felt her life had been squandered. So that moment when Consuelo pulls away in the carriage and looks back and sees her mother weeping is not this moment of heartless triumph that it seems to be. It's a tragic moment for mother as well as daughter, right? Here is a woman, Alva, who made a series of incredibly impossible and difficult choices. She has alienated her own daughter in order to save her daughter. And she's made this impossibly difficult so social step of divorcing her husband in, t in order to conserve her own self-respect. Right? All of society has turned against her. She is enduring this incredible hell. hell. But she doesn't turn back. And why? because she doesn't accept society's judgment against her as legitimate. Right? They haven't given her standing. Right? They don't care what she says. There isn't a case where people have listened to her and treated her with respect. On the contrary, women are supposed to shut their mouths and dress up nicely and stay at home. Right? Is she treated with equality and fairness by society? No, there's one rule for women and another rule for men who are allowed to run around openly with French prostitutes while their, while their wives and children are expected to keep up appearances. Right? There are one, sets, one set of rules and one for men and one set of rules for uh, women, and she realizes that. And she realizes that the judgment that has been passed against her is not right. And at that moment, She's in that position that all radicals are in the beginning, and that is she is incredibly angry. Now think about this notion for a moment about the forms that this angry, this forms that this anger take in our society. Because I think when we look around even our own world, we see versions of this all over the place. I mean, think about the Euro crisis right now in Europe. At the root of that crisis is Greece, right? And why is Greece such a basket case? Well, for many reasons, but one of those reasons is that the people of Greece don't like to pay their taxes. 95% of Canadians pay their taxes honestly every year. The same number in the country of Greece is probably less than 40%. Now, why is that? Is that because Canadians are much more honest than Greeks? No. It's because Canadians perceive their tax system to be legitimate to give them standing, to be trustworthy, and to treat them with uh, neutrality. You can speak up about the kinds of taxes that you want, and people will listen. The tax uh, system more or less treats everybody equally. There isn't a special deal for one kind of person and a special deal um, for the other. And you have a pretty good sense about the way the tax system is going to look like tomorrow or next year or the year after that. It's predictable, right? Greeks have none of that. They don't have a sense that if they speak up, the political system will listen to them. They think the system is fixed, right? 
Legitimately so. They don't think the system is fair. They know that wealthy people in Greece pay no taxes at all, and working people do. Do they think the system is predictable from year to year? No. For all they know, tomorrow they'll wake up and they'll be victims of a system they could never have imagined. They suspect, I think correctly, that the system has been wired for the benefit of a small, very elite group. The system, in other words, has no legitimacy, and it's no surprise under those circumstances that they choose to defy it. But let me give you another example. Why is it so incredibly um, harmful uh, to be the victim of an alcoholic abusive parent? Is it because of the nature of the physical violence that that parent inflicts on you as a child? Sort of, but not really. The physical injuries aren't the issue, right? The rare is the, is the alcoholic parent who delivers some kind of permanent, debilitating, or even fatal physical injury. The core issue is the legitimacy of that kind of punishment. Does the child of an alcoholic parent uh, feel that they have standing when it comes to punishment? Can they stand up to their parent and say, I did this, I don't deserve that punishment, you ought to treat me with more fairness? No. None of that exists in a family with an abusive uh, parent. Do they have a feeling that justice or punishment is enacted with neutrality in their family? No. One of the things we know about abusive and alcoholic parents is that they will pick on one child over another, right? And be the furthest thing from neutral in the way they discipline their children. And is it predictable? Can you, can you predict from one moment to the next the way your parent will behave? No. That's the biggest problem with an alcoholic parent. They are completely and utterly unpredictable. The violence, the physical discipline that is, that is enacted by the abusive parent fails every test of legitimacy. And that's why it's so extraordinarily corrosive and distrust, dis disruptive and leaves scars at last for the balance of that poor child's, poor child's life. You know, I think about this all the time when I think about American policy in Afghanistan. If you listen to the way that Americans describe their military operations and successes in Afghanistan, they will go on and on about how the drone attacks have become more and more specific and more and more accurate to the point that they are only killing the people they want to kill with a minimum of collateral damage. And they use that as evidence somehow of the efficaciousness and triumph of American forces in Afghanistan. But the truth is that the accuracy of drone, attack, of, of drone attacks in Afghanistan is absolutely and fundamentally irrelevant. That's not the issue. The issue is the legitimacy of those attacks. And the people in Afghanistan don't care about whether you hit the right person or not. No, their issue is the form of that the violence is taking, that they don't believe that America has standing in their country, right? that they are a foreign interloper. As I noticed recently, there was a fascinating observation made that over the last two years, the accuracy of drone attacks has increased dramatically. Right? The number of innocent people we think we're killing has fallen to near zero. But over that same period, the amount of terrorist activity or terrorist act insurgent activity by Afghans, Afghan um, insurgents against the Americans has also increased. Right? The more effective we've uh, gotten at killing them, the angrier they've gotten at us. Right? Why? Because every time we kill one of them, the, Ill the seeming illegitimacy of the military, the Western military presence in Afghanistan grows. We're trapped in a deterrence mindset in that country, and deterrence has nothing to do whatsoever with the nature of that conflict. So back to Alva. Here we have this rich and profoundly unhappy woman and she's really angry. She's been denied legitimacy by the culture of which she's a part. She's this kind of ticking time bomb. And in the greatest of ironies, the charge that sets her off turns out to come from her daughter, Consuelo. In her years of marriage to Sonny Churchill, Consuelo ends up being transformed. She bears Sonny two sons, and she refers to them as an heir and a spare, which I think is a lovely phrase. 
And after 10 years, she leaves him. But she does it with such grace and dignity that all of London rallies around her and not around uh, Sonny. And at the same time, she develops a real social conscience. And she becomes one of the most important and powerful philanthropists in all of England. And she's now turns into this tall and beautiful, charismatic woman. And in the spring of 1908, she returns to New York. And she gives a very famous speech at the Waldorf Astoria um, in front of all of the society ladies of New York City. And what she has discovered in her time in England is that English society is generations ahead of American society. And that women in particular play a much greater role and a much more important role in English society than they do um, across the Atlantic. They're actively involved in charity work. They're actively involved in public affairs. Um, they play a really key role um, in um, the functioning, social functioning of their society. And in her speech, Consuelo basically stands up before all of the powerful, wealthy matrons of New York. And she says that she tells them they're wasting their lives, that they are trapped by the sexist codes of their day. And she has this incredible sentence. She says, the necessity to adjust herself to man, to be judged by his individual standard, and to conform her whole personality to his ways of thinking has robbed woman of the power, strength, and influence she could have exerted as a united and independent majority. She basically tells these women that they're behaving like slaves. And as she says this, her mother, Alva, is sitting in the audience. And you can only imagine how she feels. You know, 15 years ago, she had sent her daughter off in tears to England, right? Took her away from the man she loved because she felt that only by getting Consuelo out of New York could she save Consuelo. And now Consuelo is back. And what is she saying? She's saying that she's been saved. And after the speech, the mother and daughter get together. And Consuelo says to her mother, you know, in spite of everything that happened, I'm happy I married an Englishman, right? And it's, if, it's as if Alva has been offered absolution. And this giant weight has been lifted off her back. And not long afterwards, she goes with Consuelo to a lecture on women's suffrage. And women, of course, in that time, in the early 20th century, in almost every country of the world, did not have the right to vote. And um, even within the United States, there were incredibly limited voting rights for women. And Alva is listening to this message, and she's suddenly transfixed. It's like the scales fall from her eyes. And she realizes that if women are ever going to, to, uh, uh, to undergo the kind of transformation that her daughter was talking about, this is how it has to happen. The only way to make society legitimate is to give every man and woman standing, to make it possible for every adult to be heard in the political process. And she looks at the campaign for women's voting rights that's going on at the time, and she realizes um, that it's going nowhere. At that point, only four incredibly small marginal American states allow women to vote. And that's Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, and Colorado. And all of that happened 20 years before. The movement has ground to a halt. It's got no money, no visibility, no energy, and no strategic vision. And she realizes those are four things that she, Alva, has in abundance. And so she just moves in this little dynamo with this massive ego, and she takes over. And she moves the headquarters of the suffragette movement from Warren, Ohio, where it was for all for no particularly good reason. She moves it to New York City and she sets them up in an office building on Fifth Avenue and she starts to hold a series of high profile conferences for the women of the entire country at her cottage in, in Newport, Rhode Island. And she goes and she, she, she joins up with a group of female garment workers in New York who are, who've gone on strike in, um, after they've been horribly abused by their employers. And she marches with them at the front through downtown Manhattan. And when they're all thrown in jail, she's the one who pays for the attorneys. And she's the one who sits all night in a courtroom, glaring at the judge until he lets these women um, free. And she's the one who turns to black women at the time and says that you belong in our movement. That your cause is as worthy um, as ours. And when the movement grows conservative and women start thinking that maybe we shouldn't be making these aggressive demands on the system, Alva is the one who stands up and says, no, you have to be aggressive. We can't do some kind of minor political action. We've got to push for a constitutional amendment. Right? 
And when women say one thing we should never do in our movement is antagonize men, it's Alva who stands up and says, you know, men would never worry about antagonizing men. And throughout the years of the, of the First World War, when many women said, this is not a time for us to be pushing uh, for, the, for, for, for voting rights, we have a, a larger cause, Alva's the one who says no. We have to keep fighting for this because it's every bit as important as some war in faraway Europe. And it's Alva who makes sure that every single day during the First World War, there are women carrying picket signs uh, for, on behalf of, suffragette, of the suffragette movement outside um, the White House. She puts every ounce of her domineering, dictator, dic dic dictatoring, manipulative, ambitious personality um, on behalf of this particular cause. Um, and you know what happens. She is ostracized and vilified and, and denounced at every corner, but she wins. On May 19th, 1999, the 19th Amendment to the United States is passed, which gives women full voting rights um, in perpetuity. Alva wins. And the lesson of her victory, I think, applies as equally today as it did to her time. It applies to Arab dictators who try and keep their, uh, their people down. It applies to the United States when they kidnap people and take them to undisclosed locations to torture them. And it, it applies to prime ministers who want to run roughshod of, over the feelings of their countrymen. Um, and it is, the lesson is very simple, and it's this, that the powerful are judged not just by their ends, but by their means. And if you deny people legitimacy, they will one day, by one means or another, come back and defeat you. One last thing, Alva, Alva dies in January of 1933 from a stroke. And the funeral is held at St. Thomas Church in Fifth Avenue, where Consuela was married. And the limousines line up and up and down Fifth Avenue. It's the it is the grandest funeral of that year in New York City. And uh, all of the nation's most prominent feminists show up, and they carry her coffin into the church. And uh, the congregation sings two hymns. The first is the, is the battle song of the suffragette movement, which is the March of the Women. And the second is a hymn that Alva herself composed for this very occasion, which I think is the perfect summary of this strange and wonderful woman. And the hymn is all about Alva going to heaven and how she would be damned if some man called St. Peter was going to stand in judgment of her. <laughs> and it begins, and I love this, no waiting at the gates of paradise, no tribunal of men to judge. The watchers of the tower proclaim a daughter of the king. Thank you.